young people and adults alike. If you don't learn this lesson well, you could disqualify yourself from the podium of immortality when Jesus returns. God is very serious about this, even if the world is not. Hi, this is Tracy with KOGmissions.com. And today we're going to talk about anger management. That's in today's words is anger management. And it's a very serious teaching that we must understand and learn what God wants us to know about anger. The world typically thinks strong people always show their strength by hurting others or suppressing other people. The Bible tells us the opposite. When we are weak, then we are strong. And when we control ourselves, we are truly strong, even stronger than a successful military warrior. As Proverbs 16.32 says, it is better to be slow to anger than to be a mighty warrior, and that the one who controls his temper is better than one who captures a city. So what better place to learn about anger and the wisdom and strength that comes from controlling our anger than in the Bible. Anger is not a bad thing. It's an emotion that God allows us to feel. And we see that God himself feels anger. But his anger is not out of control, even if his discipline or his punishment is very severe. We typically see that God is angry over sin. He is furious when his people worship other gods rather than him, the one true God. Even as God allows us to think any thought that we want, he still demands that we control those thoughts. And as Christians, we are told to control our anger and not let it control us. Jesus even felt anger. But as we saw when he turned over the tables in the temple, that this was a righteous anger. He wasn't angry because somebody offended him personally. He was very upset that they were not showing the father the respect that he deserved. And Ephesians 4, 26 through 27 explains this to us. Be angry and do not sin. So do not let the sun go down on the cause of your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. In that verse, we see that we are allowed to get angry, but we are not allowed to sin just because we are angry. Being angry gives no one the right to sin or to disobey God or to hurt other people just because we feel something was unfair or because we're mad. The world tells us that it's okay to respond sinfully if we're angry or hurt, but God says no. And quite often being hurt or offended leads to anger, so it is better to deal with those feelings right away which this verse says to do as well. Don't go to bed angry, deal with it. A good practice is to evaluate our feelings, especially anger, and ask ourselves, why does that make me angry? In reality, people don't make you angry. You allow something they do or say to make you angry. It is what that is so that you can deal with the root for your sake and for theirs. You must evaluate and see if your anger is a righteous anger or a selfish one because you are just thinking of yourself. Another good practice is not to respond to anger with more anger. We are told that without wood, a fire goes out in Proverbs 26, 20. We should keep that in mind when we want to respond to people angrily when we feel that they've mistreated us. Another verse wisely tells us that a gentle response turns away anger, but harsh words stir up wrath. Proverbs 15, 1. And this is one that I committed to memory way back in the sixth grade, and I still need to keep working on it to this day, but it's very wise advice. It means that if someone is yelling at you, you shouldn't yell back. Pretty simple, right? And if we must respond, we should speak quietly and gently, even if they keep yelling. Eventually, the fire will burn out because there's no fuel added to it from your side. 
If we remain calm and speak with a gentle response, it should diffuse the argument. I have often found this true in my own life. Have you ever heard the phrase that someone is a hothead? What do you think that means? I think it means that they get angry fast and react without thinking. Proverbs 15, 18 and 19, 11 wisely address this. A quick tempered man stirs up dissension but one who is slow to anger calms a quarrel. Do you stir up or calm quarrels? A person's wisdom has made him slow to anger and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. Even if we feel we have the right to take action or express our anger, it will be to our glory if we choose to overlook the evil that is done to us, just like Jesus did. He chose to give up that right when he was crucified. And it says that he did not even open his mouth. Proverbs also tells us that fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. And if we fear God, we should then listen to him and be slow to anger. In Proverbs 1, 7 and 9, 10. This next verse is a vivid picture. For as churning of milk produces butter, and as punching the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. Proverbs 30, 33. Do you ever stir up strife and provoke others to anger? Do you know the buttons to push that will make your siblings, your parents, or your spouse really mad, and then you keep pushing them? Don't do it. It won't end well. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 is clear that we have a choice. Do not let yourself be quickly provoked for anger resides in the lap of fools. We are told not to let ourselves be quickly provoked. We must keep our peace and remain calm. And this is our choice. We can't blame the other person. This is quite interesting in Matthew 5, 21 through 22. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to an older generation, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subjected to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with a brother will be subjected to judgment, and whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council, and whoever says fool will be sent to fiery hell. That's pretty scary. Jesus compares being angry to murder. Jesus really did raise the standard for believers much higher. Before, God told people to not commit murder, and that's a good thing. But Jesus said, don't even get angry at people and don't insult them. Do you ever get angry with your brother and insult him and call him names? Again, don't do it. Galatians 5, 19 through 25 tells us if we don't control our anger, that is considered a work of the flesh. And again, this shows us that we have a choice to control our anger or not. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. I am warning you as I had warned you before. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Having outbursts of anger are very serious to God, as we see here. The writer then compares those works of the flesh to the works of the spirit, or what fruit we will have in our lives if we choose to be led by the spirit rather than by our flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there's no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with, the, with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. So ask yourself when you get angry, am I acting according to the spirit or according to the flesh? You do have a choice if you will live according to the flesh or according to the spirit. Colossians 3, 8 through 10 tells us to put off all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with its practices and have been clothed with the new man. 
we should continually be asking ourselves, am I putting off all those old things and clothing myself with the new man? We need to understand this, dear brothers and sisters, as James 1, 19 through 21 tells us, let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. So put away all filth and evil excess and humbly welcome the message implanted within you, which is able to save your souls. We are told to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Ask yourself next time you're angry, would God be angry at this? And if so, how would he respond? And remember, we need to leave room for God's judgment. We do not need to punish people now for their sin. That will be taken care of in the future. Even God does not open the earth now and swallow people up when they sin today, nor does he tell us to stone the disobedient child. Just like a child left in charge of his siblings, he doesn't have that responsibility to take action on those he is watching when they misbehave. He can report it to his parents or other adults if he has not been specifically told how to deal with their disobedience. 2 Timothy 1.7 encourages us that we don't need to be afraid because God has given us self-control and love. We just need to use them. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. You have a choice how you act and how you react. God will not make you act one way or another. You get to choose. Just realize that blessings or curses follow your decisions and your actions. Even younger men are encouraged to be self-controlled. And one of the benefits of that is that you will be an example to others. And another benefit is that people will not be able to realistically criticize you, even if they still do, they won't have warrant to do so. Titus 2.6 tells older men to encourage younger men to be self-controlled. Again, showing yourself to be an example of good works in every way. In your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and a sound message that cannot be criticized, so that any opponent will be at a loss because he has nothing evil to say about us. And not only are we told to do this so people won't be able to criticize us, but even more importantly, so that the gospel, our sound message of the kingdom and of Jesus, will not be criticized. Paul creates a good picture for us that's easy to understand. Do you not know that all runners in a stadium compete, but only one receives the prize? So run to win. Each competitor must exercise self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable one. Paul lets us know that there is a benefit for playing fair for us today, but even more so in the future when we can receive an imperishable reward, which is immortality. We will end with Paul's heartfelt and wise words that we too ought to strive to say as well. So I do not run uncertainly or box like one who hits only air. Instead, I subdue my body and make it my slave so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. You know, you can get disqualified. Don't be foolish and let anger steal your reward. You must learn to control your body and to make it listen to you, your mind, your mouth, and your actions for the benefit of others and so that you will not get red carded or disqualified from life in the age to come. God gives us plenty of opportunities each day to learn to control our bodies better. We can learn to control our thoughts, we can control our speech, our actions, and even our feelings. And so we need to practice this when the opportunity arises, even with the little things that seem to not really matter a whole lot in the big scheme of things. And we can practice that with our younger siblings or people at work or other people driving on the roads. These little things help us to mature and to become more like Christ. 
because we claim to follow him if we call ourselves Christians. And so we should become more like him, whether we're young or we're old, all alike, we should become more like Christ and learn to control those feelings, especially the feeling of anger, because we see that we can be disqualified from the prize that is resurrection and immortality when Jesus returns, if we choose not to practice self-control. So I encourage you to take each little opportunity that comes your way and practice that self-control and practice being more like Christ and controlling your anger. Have a blessed day.